Hello. Testing.
beautiful today. You
down a new one later, but I'm, I'm going to talk from the mic for now. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, there I am. So if uh, you're watching live stream, I'm Joel Miller. I'm the interim minister at All Souls. And so glad to welcome you all here this morning. Happy Easter. We have so many things that are, that are going on in the life of the congregation, and there's so many cool things going on in the community around us. Um, it seemed appropriate for Easter to wish a uh, continued Ramadan Mubarak to our Muslim neighbors. They're in the middle of Ramadan right now. Passover started Friday night. Happy Passover to our Jewish neighbors. Happy Easter to all of us and all our neighbors who are uh, celebrating this most important Christian holiday this morning. Happy spring to those of us who uh, are earth-based or pagan in our orientation. It's a great day for the Easter Bunny and um, the goddess of the sunrise. And a happy Vaishakhi holiday to our Sikh neighbors uh, they celebrated this on April 14th in celebration of the spring harvest. And uh, we know they had also a uh, difficult um, anniversary this, this past Thursday. And uh, our thoughts and love are with them. So um, there are some Ramadan treats that will come along with coffee after the service. So... Uh, uh, Thank you, Elizabeth. That'll be fun. And uh, just because I'm a little ornery, I brought some, um, I wouldn't call it a treat exactly. I brought some uh, gluten-free matzah and some horseradish because Passover. <laughs> Actually, I like, I like horseradish, but maybe, maybe that doesn't go with the, the, the Ramadan treats. I don't know. And I hope that everybody at home got some chocolate for Easter. Um, I'm taking way too long for these announcements. Um, <laughs> I'm so glad to see you all like, here on Easter with all of you. This is great. Um, if you are, uh, would like to attend the Youth Con Conservation, April 22nd and 24th, today is the day to register. Now is the time. So um, Sarah is sitting down here front. She has the uh, Easter uh, uh, Easter bunny ears on her head. If you're watching by live stream, um, uh, email us and let us know that you're registering. Um, it looks really cool. And it's happening in Muncie, right? Awesomeness. There's uh, uh, an announcement that went out about the uh, two congregational meetings because uh, beginning April 8th and ending, uh, excuse me, May 8th and ending May 15th is Candidating Week with uh, Reverend uh, Katie Romana Griffin. And there's a congregational meeting right after the service on the 15th. There's also a congregational meeting, the annual regular congregational meeting on the 22nd. Y'all are busy right now. You're doing, you're doing great work, all souls. Thank you. And um, if you want to know more about these things that I'm talking about up here, um, and you're visiting, there's connection cards. There's purple cards in the pews, and there'll be a link in the, um, um, in the live stream so you can find out how to learn about more or maybe call up Reverend Joel and say, hey, can we have some coffee? Good morning and welcome. What would we do without technology? <laughs> Good morning. Happy Easter. And welcome to those joining us virtually and those of you present here at All Souls Unitarian Church of Indianapolis. I'm Rick May, serving as worship associate for today's service. If you are visiting us this morning, we are glad you are here with us. We welcome you and invite you to bring with you this morning your whole self as you join us in worship. 
In a few moments, we will open our service with the reading of the covenant and chalice lighting. These rituals remind us to continually renew our promise to live into our covenant, to put love into action, and to live out the community of love and justice that we aim to be. Our topic this morning is the celebration and insights of Easter. Again, welcome. Let us worship together. How am I doing? Oh, yeah. There was an Easter egg hunt yesterday, yes? And how, did all of you get to do the Easter egg hunt yesterday? Looks like, yeah, everybody's nodding. All right. You know, um, the first time I did an Easter egg hunt, I was, uh, that wasn't at my home. That was at like a, a community Easter egg hunt. I was about six years old. And um, I didn't realize when we went, there, there was a huge crowd, but including in this crowd of people who are going to do Easter egg hunting were like 11 and 12 year old kids who were really focused on getting some Easter eggs. And um, they had like a starting gun for it. And all I remember is that I was trampled. And when I looked up, the eggs were gone. There was nothing. I was like, I didn't, I didn't ever want to do that Easter egg hunt again. So it was uh, really lovely because yesterday, uh, I understand that um, everybody got a great haul. <laughs> everybody found some great Easter eggs. And in fact, I know, um, I, I just heard a story that one of our kids found two, two of the golden Easter eggs. Yeah. And you gave one away? That's why I come to church. <laughs> I invite you into the spirit of love and celebration, all souls. This congregation that longs to roll away the stones that turn our hearts into tombs, that longs to give the light of hope and love to all the world. Let our celebration remind us that even after the most difficult times, the spirit of life returns and joy can be found again. Let Easter come. This morning, we invite Miss Bridget Perdue to light our chalice for us. It's been a minute since the choir has sung in this service. I know, it's exciting. I first of all want to introduce you to our fabulous guest pianist. Please say hi to Claire Longendike. This seemed like a fitting piece for us to sing on our first Sunday back in over two years. Uh, the text is uh, a, a text that was in, originally sung about the 8th century, usually during Easter week on Maundy Thursday. And the opening line says, where there are charity and love, there is God.
I'm just so glad to hear you singing. Makes me so happy. I might be uh, especially partial to uh, choirs and pianos since uh, when I was growing up, uh, we didn't have an organ in the church, but we uh, had a piano and um, the choir sang. And uh, for some time I sang in the choir as well. And uh, I'm just so glad that uh, we can have you singing here, that we have a, 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 a heritage in the congregation where we have good ventilation, you're all willing to vax, we're, we're um, and with some testing and some distance, we can keep ourselves really quite safe here. Safety is not a guaranteed thing in the world. I remember an Easter, I think I was maybe eight. I had, um, I had a cat when I was a little kid, Callie. Uh, Callie because she was a calico. And uh, she, um, one March, she, could, she disappeared. We didn't know where she was. We didn't know what was going on. And Easter came. It was a little earlier that year in April. And I thought, I thought Callie had died. Maybe something had happened. And I was pretty sad about it. Easter morning. I came down, I knew that my parents had hidden eggs. We, we didn't do any more of the community egg hunts after that. <laughs> but we had egg hunts at home, and I came downstairs, and we weren't supposed to start the hunt, but the, my mom would have the Easter baskets out, and of course chocolate, right? First thing in the morning, get that buzz going right away. And <sighs> Callie was there all of a sudden and meowed at me, and then ran down the basement stairs. And I was like, Callie. And I ran downstairs, and there was Callie in this little space wedged behind the furnace in the basement. I ran back up, and I, I, I yelled to my mom, I, my, Callie's here. My brothers and, and my parents came tumbling down the stairs like, what's going on? I ran back downstairs to stay with her. She was having kittens. She'd been hiding because that's what cats like to do when they're about to have babies. And so I spent one Easter morning watching Callie have four kittens. And that felt like the perfect kind of Easter morning for me. I still remember those, those little uh, baby kittens, how small and vulnerable and beautiful they were. For some of us, uh, for all of us, actually, at some time in our lives, we experience times that are difficult. Times uh, in, in the Christian Bible, there's a story about when, when Jesus dies and his family and friends put his body in a tomb. And for folks who follow the Christian tradition, there is, that's understood to have happened on a Friday. And there are those, there's just a little over a day in which there's the time of being in a tomb. It's a difficult time. It's a metaphor or a way of, of saying it by a story. There's sometimes we feel like we've lost a lot. It feels closed in. Somebody's put a big rock in front of the door. And Easter feels like a day when someone's moved the rock back out of the doorway and the sun is rising, and bright and beautiful, and the sky is blue, and the, the buds are coming out on the trees, and the magnolias are starting to bloom, and it's beautiful. And that's how Easter can feel for folks who, especially for some Unitarian Universalists who might practice Christianity. That day with Callie felt very much like that. And even though at the... Uh, uh, many times in my life, I really have never thought of myself as a practicing Christian. I've always appreciated the, the, the wisdom of knowing that there are times when we feel loss or, or fear or the unknown. 
or all of the above. And somewhere, somehow, there's the promise of something else returning, something new being born. And that's very much something I take from Easter. And that's why I always think back on that time when Callie had her kittens behind the furnace Easter morning. I'm always a little put off by Easter. Does anyone else feel confused or intimidated by Easter? Easter raises all sorts of prickly theological questions for me, including why does a hare or rabbit hop around with baskets full of chicken embryos? <laughs> Wouldn't a bird or turtle, fish, or even a platypus make more sense? <laughs> At least they all lay eggs. But apparently I'm on to something regarding the selection of an Easter mascot. This year, Cadbury, the giant British candy maker, had a contest to determine the next Cadbury bunny. But there was no bunny among the 10 finalists. There is one bird. Breaking news, breaking news. Uh, <laughs> Cadbury just announced that the 2022 Easter Bunny is actually a dog. Actually, a uh, Ohio therapy dog. Oh well, I guess that didn't, they didn't listen to my mascot advice. But the list of questions goes on and on. Most of major religions seem to have an afterlife. However, I'm unsure if there's enlightenment, reincarnation, resurrection, or hell. The universalist part of UU believes in universal salvation or universalism. It's defined as through goodness, mercy, and the love of God, all people will be saved. Universalism means that there are no barriers to an afterlife. There is no need for sacrifice or atonement. Today on Easter, we join pagans and other religions in celebrating both spring and new life. For me, Easter celebrates not just life, but a life that is heaven on earth. I often wonder if there is a heaven, maybe this heaven is right here on earth. What if Eden is here and now? After all, there's no law that prevents us from celebrating Easter every day. We might only have one life to live, so we should live it to the fullest. Maybe this is the Garden of Eden. We just don't recognize it. Over time, we spoiled that Eden. It could be that we just lost our way. After all, we have numerous resources, both natural and man-made. We have things like nature, beauty, art, love, miracles and each other that are all awesome and spectacular. We have science and creativity. If heaven is on earth, then the key actions are strong stewardship and a fair resource distribution. If heaven is on earth, our seventh principle to affirm and promote respect for the independent web of all existence, which we are part of, becomes critical. If heaven is on earth, shouldn't everybody enjoy a more or less equitable slice of that heaven? Heaven may not even be a place as much as a consciousness, a perspective, or an attitude. Any place can probably be heavenly with the right state of mind. The concept on heaven on earth requires looking at the resources and the good things that we have with both gratitude and appreciation. In community organizing, there's a tool called acid mapping. That's where a community focuses on the assets that it has rather than its deficits. I think we could all benefit from acid mapping our lives. Each day, hundreds of amazing wonders are revealed. We only have to notice them, experience in them, appreciate them, share them. These wonders are both large and small. 
the smell of bread baking, the sound of a Beethoven symphony, an ice cream cone on a summer evening, the warmth of a hug, the scale of the universe. Heaven happens when peace wins over war, when good triumphs over evil, when love overcomes hate, and when justice succeeds over injustice. One of the lessons for me about Easter is that it's possible to move from sorrow to joy. It takes its own time. Perhaps that's why the uh, Easter metaphor of the tomb sometimes can be helpful for folks. I don't think, however, that it's ever useful or even appropriate to expect someone to stay in that metaphorical, that poetic tomb. It's why we share joys and sorrows, to remind ourselves that life moves. Rick mentioned universalism, and uh, about 100 years ago, someone asked a uh, universalist theologian, what do universalists stand for? And uh, the universalist's reply was, well, we don't stand for anything, we, we move. We love. And in the motion and cycles of life today, as we do every Sunday, we remember joys and sorrows. Of course, a joy. The choir sang today after two years. A joy that there are so many different ways that the spirit of life speaks through humanity. Ramadan, Passover, Easter, spring, and the return of life and love. We keep in our thoughts and our prayers those in our congregation who are struggling, those who may be facing great transitions in life, we carry more sometimes than we can say. Sometimes it's important to know that community is there just to be seen and to be loved and to know the sun will rise, the stones will roll away. Next Easter, may the world be so much closer to peace, perhaps maybe even be a day without war. Amen. This morning, our offertory contributions will go to our very own East Coast Migrant Head Start Project, Indianapolis campus. Your contributions today will support the Head Start Project to provide the supplies and the educational toys that will help the children receive a high quality education to support school readiness. The children of migrant and seasonal farm workers are cared for and advocated for in a culturally sensitive way. And so are their parents who matter the most to these children. To contribute, you can put cash or check into the collection plate, or if online, you can go to allsoulsindy.org, where you will find a link that says, Give to All Souls Here on the left side, which is beneath the description for today's service. Be sure to mention your donation is for the Head Start Project. Thank you for your generosity 
in supporting the mission of all souls and for your continued love for one another and for this world. May we now accept our morning offering. Am I up? Yeah. Oh, there, now I am. Good. Thank you. Easter can be so complicated. You know, the, uh, well, you know, just for a Unitarian Universalist minister, as I was mentioning, um, you know, this is the most important holy day for Unitarian Universalist Christians. Many of us came from other religious traditions where the experience of Easter was pretty negative. Um, some of us, came from, uh, are, are Jews and come from a, a Jewish background. Some of us are Muslims. I served a congregation 20 years ago that uh, had a regular uh, meeting of Muslim Unitarian Universalists. We have Buddhists, we have Hindus, we have none of the above. We have atheists, we have, we're, compli we're complicated, you know? I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't give it up for anything. So, Easter is a complicated word, actually. It's an interesting word. The word Easter is actually not a Christian word. Um, in, in 1988, 
I bought the 1984, I think it was, version of the Christian uh, Dictionary and Encyclopedia. And I looked up, uh, as I was studying one spring, I looked up the word Easter, and it only, the only thing it said was, Easter, see Resurrection Sunday. That's all it said. I was like, okay, something's up. And I looked it up and, and discovered that Easter actually is the name for this holiday uh, only in English and in um, uh, German. Uh, and the reason is, is that um, those Teutonic folks, um, when Christianity and paganism started to mush together and, and bring together things like crosses and eggs, um, they weren't giving up the name Easter, which what happened to be the, actually the name of the Teutonic goddess of the sunrise. That's where the name Easter comes from. Uh, her escort was a, a, a hare, a bunny, um, who carried eggs around. So... <laughs> In most of the world, those uh, Christian world and, and uh, uh, in most of the world in general, this holiday um, is known as Passover, a Christian Passover, or Paschal, another language, Pascha, Pascha, Pasca, Pascalia. Passover because, well, the Last Supper was a Passover supper because Jesus was a, a Jewish teacher, a rabbi, and he was celebrating a Jewish holiday as a Jew. I grew up in a Unitarian Universalist church that um, didn't really quite know what to do with Easter in, in Columbus, Ohio. Now, I love this congregation very, very much, I must say, but we Unitarian Universalists aren't uh, averse to sometimes understanding ourselves lightly. Um, so while, you know, it, it often felt like while our neighbors were talking about, he is risen, glory be, and we were saying flowers, yay. <laughs> Truth be told, my mom really didn't want to go to church on Easter. And uh, um, my dad was very happy not, not to be in a crowd of folks, so we did an Easter egg hunt at home, and, and uh, I would be home for my cat, Callie, and... I liked doing that pagan parts of Easter when uh, I had children, and their mom and I uh, would work with them, and we would dye eggs and paint eggs, and we would have a lot of fun with that, and the first time we dyed eggs with our children, um, and then we hid them after they'd gone to bed. We didn't keep track of the eggs. <laughs> we finally found the last one because we smelled it. <laughs> so I got to theological school without a lot of in-depth understanding of Christianity and really even Unitarian Universalist Christianity or even Jesus, really. I was amazed when I started reading the Bible and, and finding out who Jesus was. This was not, not the fellow that um, my neighbors had been telling me about or I'd, find, I'd hear about when I was a kid on the playground. Um, have you found Jesus yet? And I'd, I, I was, I'd be confused by that, especially since in one breath they would say, God loves you, but if you don't believe in God, then they would say, You'll go to hell and burn forever. And this made no sense. And then I read about Jesus in the Bible and in some other gospels, gospels meaning good news in, in, in Greek, and uh, ones that the Roman Empire deci didn't decide to put in the official uh, canon, as they call it. This guy was a total revolutionary. He was not the, uh, the, the establishment guy who had a plan for your life. This was a radical, nonviolent, barefoot teacher who wandered around the countryside healing people and annoying the authorities. And as a kid who grew up Unitarian Universalist, I found that kind of very interesting and attractive. And as I read him, I found he had something to say to me across 2,000 years, three translations, and a lot of spin doctoring. Now, from a historian's perspective, there's no actual facts about Jesus. 
Well, there are three. We know that he was a rabbi, that he led a group of Jews in a kind of insurrection, and that he was executed because there are contemporaneous non-Jewish, non-Christian writings about that happening. So those are considered historical facts. But when I read those old stories, the four gospels, the 35 or so other gospels that have been found that the Roman Empire didn't manage to destroy, there's this voice that comes through out of the mess of words and spin doctoring and Roman imperial editing, someone speaks or someone is doing something that comes out of the static of of that received history. And it goes through the Aramaic into the Greek, into the Latin, into the English. Across 2,000 years. I finally got to understand that there's even scholars who, who are looking at this voice. One of those scholars is John Dominic Crossan, and he wrote a book, God and Empire. Jesus loved to play with memes. He loved to play with uh, official symbols and symbolism. So in the time of Jesus, he's living in, in, um, in a land that's been conquered by Rome, It's under the imperial rule of a a Roman governor, a guy named Pilate. And in imperial Rome had its own propaganda. They arrived, and after they had um, subjugated everyone and taken whatever it was they wanted, they would say, we're here to bring our Roman peace. You've been liberated. Pay up. (laughs) Roman emperors were divine. They were saviors of the world. Roman language. They were the saviors of the world. Even Roman money had an image of the emperor, the Caesar. And the emperor, the Caesar, was surrounded by the words, the son of God. They like to make you think you were living in a a, a good situation, but, you know, after the imperial legions conquered... The first thing they did was set up a a, a very effective bureaucracy. They usually would uh, find the most corrupt uh, local criminals they could find, and they would say, we want you to be the tax collectors. And they would, their job was to tax their neighbors as much as they could without causing a revolt or a collapse of the economy. These local plutocrats, they could these local oligarchs, if you will. They could enrich themselves, but not too much. Rome had to get what Rome expected. They wanted massive returns on those armies, those navies, those bureaucracies. Well, they were pushing it a little too much in, uh, in Judea and Israel in the time of Jesus. There were a number of rebels in those days. Jesus was also a rebel, but he was a rebel that preached a form of nonviolence and noncompliance, even more importantly. And this is how I came to understand this context of Jesus, this rebel. Here's some of the distinct Jesus voices that rise above the editing and the, the spin doctoring of thousands of years. You've heard it said says Jesus, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Later he says, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. One of my favorites, one of the first things I actually read in the Gospel of Luke. Think for yourselves. I grew up a humanist, Unitarian Universalist. I was totally into that. Think for yourselves, Jesus said that? Okay, I've not heard that one before. And then he goes on to say, if you let somebody else do your thinking, they will make you pay and make you pay and make you pay. How true it is. And then he says later, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. By that, I think he meant children of God. 
But sons of God specifically in that gendered form, it's interesting that pagans, Roman, the Roman Empire eventually needed to make Jesus into a, a, a three-part, part of a three-part God, the Trinity, if you will. Um, something our Unitarian ancestors said, that doesn't make sense, we don't want to do that. Um, and indeed, if understanding the Bible, Jesus never claims to be the Son of God, the only child of God. He never calls himself that. His followers called him a son of God, a son of God. And in the uh, ancient Aramaic of the time, a son of God, there were lots of sons of gods. There were lots of daughters of God, children of God, because a good person was a child of God. That's what, it was a, it was a colloquial term in Aramaic. But for Jesus' followers to sort of very loudly proclaim a son of God under Roman imperial rule was a dangerous thing to do. Perhaps that would sound a bit too much like a challenge to the Caesar's one true child of God status. Jesus understood the power of words, of language, and the language of love especially. He let his followers call him a son of God, knowing it was subversive. And then he took it a step further. He talked about the empire of God. Now, you had Romans' imperial rule, and it was supposed to be wonderful, and it was awful, as everybody knew. Nobody was fooled by the propaganda. There was one true empire. But Jesus said, no, there's another empire. There's the empire of God, not the empire of Rome. He didn't say not the empire of Rome. He talked about the empire of God. Usually it's translated as the kingdom of God. But then you would have to say the kingdom of Rome. And Rome was not a kingdom. And Jesus was not talking about kingdoms. He was talking about empires. If you go back to the Greek, the word is basileia. One empire was filled with soldiers, tax collectors, and violence if you rose up against the Caesar in any kind of verbal way. The other empire was filled with children, lepers, women who liked sex, people who wanted to learn to read. It was an empire of the poor and the peaceful. Now that's the kind of empire I think we build when our children learn from us, share those golden eggs. That's the kind of empire Jesus was talking about. He was teaching about resistance. We will never overcome hate with hate. We will never raise an army strong enough to defeat all the armies and bring permanent peace. Because eventually the army will be split by its own hatred and war will begin again. I should say at the moment, I'm not a strict pacifist. Um, glory to Ukraine. I hope they win. But to fight and perhaps to die for a better world, it's really to fight for a world that someday won't need war. And that does require that kind of resistance that Jesus was talking about. And he was talking, he did say, resist. There's that line he says, turn the other cheek. And he doesn't mean, yeah, go for the other slap. That's not what Jesus was talking about. Jesus was talking about what Gandhi was inspired to say from what he learned about Jesus. Gandhi, the Hindu student and political leader and practitioner of nonviolence. Gandhi said, the first principle of nonviolent action is non-cooperation with humiliation. That's important. So when the guards come, when the soldiers come, it's, not, it's to resist by not allowing them to take your dignity away. Our first principle, that universalist principle, inherent worth and dignity of all people, it's to allow all, all of us our dignity and to recognize that the oppressors cannot take our dignity away, but we might help them reclaim their own having lost it 
and using violence against others. It's denying one who uses violence the power to humiliate us and to say back to them out of our love, I am a human being just like you. Jesus, in trying to make this point on uh, Palm Sunday, the week before, rode a donkey, an ass, into Jerusalem. And the, the symbolism was clear. He rode through the gate where everybody took their trash out. He didn't ride through the big giant gate that the Caesars would come in. He rode on a poor working person's animal. And it was a mockery of the empire. He drew crowds with his preaching in one short week. Crowds so big that the Jewish authorities didn't dare arrest him, not in public. Even when he turned over the money tables, the money changing tables in the Holy Temple. They waited until Thursday after the Passover Seder to arrest him. But then they were so afraid to actually try him and punish him, they turned him over to the Roman governor, Pilate. And Pilate executed him on a cross. Now, it's funny how that story is even spin doctored. Oh no, it was the Jews that killed him. That's not true. That didn't happen. Only the Romans allowed execution on the cross by Rome. They were the only ones allowed to do that. Rome killed Jesus. Empire killed Jesus. And they killed him for speaking truth and not, the, not bowing to empire. The thing I wondered, and still wonder, did Jesus know that he would be executed for what he was saying, what he was doing? I just imagine he must have believed in it so strongly and with so much love for his, for his neighbors, his people, his people, his Jewish people, even his other neighbors, his pagan neighbors, that he would rather speak than die? I wonder. His followers were brokenhearted when he was killed. But in that dictionary that I mentioned, it's called Resurrection Sunday because something is reborn. Something is reborn. Something has even been reborn through us, if you think about it. A universalist 200 years ago named Aidan Ballou, a minister and a passionate believer in nonviolence and peace and pacifism, began writing about the nonviolence that Jesus taught. And his works were read by a Russian named Tolstoy, who wrote his passionate belief in nonviolence and the spirit of love. And Tolstoy was read by a leader named Gandhi in India, who put that into practice. And Gandhi, in turn, was read by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who, in turn, befriended and worked with many Unitarian Universalists. The voice speaks. It still speaks to us. A revolutionary voice. One that calls us to justice and to peace. Not to wealth, but the wealth of love. Not to the power of violence, but the power of compassion. Easter comes again every year. And the dignity of our lives rises again and again. The words of the ancient prophet live in us, no matter what we believe in, how shall we live? How shall we choose to practice what we love? Let Easter live in us, not just today, but every day. May those words of love live in the generations to come. Let it be a happy Easter. Happy Easter. The world needs us, needs you. It needs this light. Which one? 61. 61 in these gray hymnals. Lo, the earth awakes again. Lo, the earth awakes again.
stones that make tombs of our hearts. Let this spirit keep us free from oppressing or being oppressed. Let these words draw us together in love and remind us always the sun will rise, joy will come again. Go in peace, be in peace. We will be together again. Thanks, Dan. Hi. Good to 